Well, we've been having a series of conversation and teaching on growing up. And uh, today we're going to be talking about children growing up. It's a third installment in the teaching. Last week, we were talking about babies. And, uh, you know, there were, those babies are cute and babies also cry. You know, and that's what many of us remember about babies. But the week before, we talked about three things growing people do. And we said growing people, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man or an adult, I, I put away childish things. And we said there are three things that would happen to you in your development. The first one is that I believe your thought will change. You need to change your thought. You need to put away childish thought. What is thought? In that passage, thought meant, thought means the assessment and judgment of something. How you to take inventory, how you estimate something, how you put something in order in your mind. And we said the thoughts originate from the information that's presented to you, but then your value for things put them in certain estimates. You put a certain estimate on something. If somebody you love, if somebody you trust says something, that thing goes in a different inventory shelf compared to somebody that's known to be not trustworthy. You, you make an assessment, you estimate. And then to understand means, the Greek word there means to exercise the mind, to set your mind on something, exercise your mind, and this is what results in your sentiments and opinion. It's a good thing to have an opinion. You have an opinion about things all the time based on what you assess, based on the, your assessment and the exercise of your mind. That's why the scripture tells us that strong meat belongs to those who are mature, who have exercised their mind through practice to discern, right? To have a sentiment to have an opinion between good and evil. So it's a good thing to have an assessment. It's a good thing to have a sentiment and opinion on things. And we said for spiritual growth, what we want to do is have the word of God be the backdrop to which we test everything. And then in the exercise of my mind with the word of God, I'm able to discern what's God's will and what's not God's will. So that's what we talked about. And then lastly, we believe that if your thought is based on the word of God, if your thinking is right, if you're exercising your mind right, then your speech will change because your speech would only, come, it would only reflect that which your mind is filled with. So the exercise of the mind. And then last week we talked about babies, and we had fun talking about babies last week. But we're going to be going on to talk about children. But first, there are different stages of development in life. Life has different stages. So I grow up, and I start out life as a baby, and then I grow into childhood, and then finally I mature into an adult. And even as an adult, I have so many opportunity to continue to grow. Physically, I may not be increasing in height, but emotionally, I'm still developing, I'm still learning, I'm still engaging myself with more information so that I can become a, 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 a well-suited and better-rounded adult. Spiritually also, God gave birth to us. When we became born again, we became born again into the household of God. We are babies. But before that, but today, let's look at children. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, 
And we're going to read from verse 14. Actually, let's read from verse 11. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, talking about the gift, uh, some of the gift that God gave the church. It said, These gifts were given for the perfecting or maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. The perfect man there means a mature man, a fully developed man. Uh, Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted that by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So what we see here is that God gave ministry gifts for the purpose of maturing believers. We said this, that it's awesome to be babies. We love babies. Babies are awesome. And it's exciting. What what was so exciting? It's exciting because they're babies. They bring so much joy. They cause joy. You know, you're just so happy to see them. You see new life beginning. The same thing for spiritual babies. But the thing is, it's not good for a baby to stay a baby. Spiritually speaking, we love it when people get saved, when people come into the body of Christ, and they're just just so happy. Oh, I feel the presence of God. It's so awesome. Oh, God is doing something in my life. Oh, I can I, 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 I can hear him speak to me. That word is for me. And it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. But to stay babies is not good. You know, it's also awesome to be children. Oh, being children is awesome. People, uh, 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 when, when, if, you, uh, if you ever move into an old neighborhood, we did. We live in an older neighborhood. And when we move into the neighborhood where one, one of the very few families with kids on our street. And then some of the older residents, when they see our kids, they just smile. You can see the smile on their faces. And then one of the ladies said to us, Lou said to us one day and said, it's so good to see children back on the street. And they're so glad that now new families are coming in. They love the energy. They love what's going on. One of the things that people love is when they see their grandchildren come visit them. They just love, you know, they love their own kids. But the grandchildren are different. There's something about children that's so exciting. Spiritually speaking, children are good. It's awesome to have children in the body of Christ. We want to see people growing. But today I want to talk about some characteristic of children so that if you are a child in the faith, you can recognize yourself. The good news about recognizing where you are is enjoy it and plan to move on. It's good to be a baby. And last week, a number of people came to me and said, I'm a baby. Thank you for that message. I'm a baby, and now I want to grow. I'm like, glory to God. That's the intent of the message, to help us identify where we are so that we can take the proper steps to start developing. And one of the reasons why we're doing foundations, uh, strong foundations is specifically that, to help believers grow from wherever they are in their spiritual development. But being children also, we need to enjoy. I don't want us to be in a rush. Some people want to be in a rush to grow up. It's a characteristic of being a child. You can't wait to grow up. We're going to get there in a moment. So let me go through a few things that are characteristic of kids. Number one, um, children lack stability. You know, so I'm going to go through. uh, uh, They lack stability. 
they're curious, they're talkative, and they're learning obedience. Now, I'm just going to talk about those things. There's a lot of other things, the characteristics of kids. I told you one of my shows in the 2000s was Kids Says the Dandest Thing. And uh, I would watch it because they would say things, and the way they would say it, it would be so funny, you know. And then sometimes some fam- uh, some some family at church will send a video of their kids saying something or singing something, and it's so cute and it's so fun. Or when you get together with parents, they have endless stories of oh they said this and they said that. And then you know, I mean, if you know moments where you wish you have the camera rolling, you've had moments like that especially with the kids, it's awesome. That's what kids are. So there's a lot of things we can say, but let's talk about this. Kids lack stability. If you think about the first time your child learned to start taking a step and walking, you didn't say, oh, took two steps, they're good. You fully expect them to not be that stable yet. So you're there to catch them. You know, in the body of Christ, spiritual babies lack stability. In Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 14. It said that we ask for, sorry, spiritual children, rather, people in the childhood development of their spiritual life, they lack stability. It said that we ask for be no more children. What is the characteristic there? Tossed, to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. That's a child. A child. Faith is so fragile. You know, one day they believe, they're excited, and then somebody else comes around and tells them something else, and they get carried away. And it's like every time there's a new flow, a new movement, they're in it. Because they lack stability. They haven't proved anything yet. They haven't, stu- uh, they haven't uh, 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 stand long enough believing anything yet. They haven't tested the veracity of what they believe in yet. They've been carried away because everything looks good. Everything looks good. Everything looks good. You know, there are people who would believe God once ever believe uh, uh, the old world saved one day, and then the next morning they're, they, they're, they're driving and they hear preachers say, Nope, God has already chosen those who are going to be saved. It doesn't matter whether you want to be saved or not, it's only the elect that will be saved. And like, oh, I guess it's only the elect. And they believe that. And then somebody knocked their door and said, Well, actually, it's not the elect. There's 144,000 people <laughs> that's going to be in heaven with him. They said, Oh, I guess I believe that. They just carried away with every wind of doctrine. And some of these children in the faith are leading our churches, they're writing our songs, and they're leaders in our spiritual community. I don't want to be a child perpetually. It's good to be a child, but you rec- need to recognize that that's not the ultimate. That's not the best that God, nothing wrong with you. It's just where you are. Don't stay there. Then that's not right. The goal, look at it. It's that God gave us all this gift in the body of Christ so that we would no longer be children. You know that as churches, as a whole could be babies. Churches as a whole could be children. Churches as a whole could be mature. We have three options. Which one are we and which one do we want to be? I want to be the mature church. Amen? Mature church. Amen? (laughs) God Zoltan's vote on that one. We want to be a mature church. We we don't want to be children perpetually. You know, children, children would seek things. Okay, so they lack stability. I mean, you, 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 you remember you, you're riding a bicycle and you fell off. And what do you do? You leave your bicycle there and run to mommy and daddy, you know, and you cry, oh. And your parents know 
that you're just a child. And they know you have to go through that. And they encourage you to get back on the same bicycle. You know, because of the lack of stability, what happens to some children is that they get hurt because they've been bounced here and bounced there. They believe something and it didn't work. And then they become disillusioned. It's just a symptom of being a child. You just can't see that far yet. You just can't see it so clearly yet. You just can't see yet because you just have not learned enough yet. In spiritual life, you see that often. People get disillusioned. Well, I don't know. You know, I tried it and it didn't work. The, uh, I've done everything they told me to do and it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work. You're just a child. And sometimes all we could do is hold you and hug you because that's all you can take because you're not stable yet. Hello? How do you get stable? Well, you get stable by doing what we said last week. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, you put aside old things and you desire the sincere milk of the word. That word will give you strength. That word will give you some stability. You start eating that word. You start eating that word, and you're holding on to that word, and you're testing it out. And you're testing it. Not testing if the word is true. Testing your competence in it. You know? You're not testing. When you were riding the bike, you're not trying to find out that a bike, two wheels, is able to hold you without a training wheel. He's is able, but it's your competence or your competency in it that you're testing. So you're testing your competency in the word of God. Oh, yeah, the Bible says, if I confess my sin, it's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I'm a baby. I'm a child. I'm stand, standing on that word. Father, I thank you. I confess my sins to you. I believe according to your word that I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm giving you a real example. Me. I did that. And I remember listening to Copeland say, and right at that moment you can say, thank you God that I am the righteousness of God. So I said, Father, thank you that according to your word if I confess my sins, You've cleansed me. The blood of Jesus Christ, your son, cleanses me. And I thank you that I'm the righteousness of God. <laughs> I am the righteousness of God because your word says it. I'm testing my competency <laughs> in the word. My conscience, my, my mind says, no, that's not true. I was as solid in it. But I'm like, this is what the word says. I'm holding on and standing in it. No stability yet, but gaining one. How many of you know that uh, Usain Bolt is fastest runner? They, let me, I, I didn't know this guy much. I've never met him in person, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt there was a time he couldn't even walk. Right? It didn't come out like a deer running, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, it didn't. that's not what he did. He had to test his competency in walking, and then he stumbled, and then he got up and did it again. And then, I mean, we were somewhere. Uh, we were at a show, and I saw kids. Uh, so I've been thinking about this message for a while, and I saw a bunch of kids, and I saw little kids, and one of them were just standing like on one foot and the other uh, just on this on a tippy toe and he said to Jen look that kid is confident enough that she can stand like that I know based on the age of the kid less than a year ago that kid was probably falling all over the place but it's now gaining confidence that, oh, yeah, this is how I distribute my weight. And then you see another one just turn around and do things. And then, wow, they're learning so fast. 
Because it's only a matter of months, and they're doing different things. And you're seeing them running and running around. And we have, at church, we see them doing that all the time. They're just running around like, hey, what, what, you're walking already? Yeah, they're running. <laughs> you know, they're developing. So lack of stability naturally happens. It happens in your spiritual walk as well. And the other way where you see this lack of stability is some believers, you need to hold them by the hand all the time. They can't believe God on their own, right? They can't believe God on their own. So there's a, there's, there's a boss at work that didn't like them. Oh, they need help, right? There's, um, you know, the, there's a zit that showed up on their face. They need help, <laughs> you know? Oh, God, help me. Can somebody pray for me? Oh, I'm so, you know, not, nothing wrong with needing help. And so I'm going to get to it in the curiosity moment in a way. But they need help because they're not sure of their standing yet. They're not sure that they can do this thing yet. And sometimes for just reason, because they haven't learned enough yet. They've not proved enough yet. But that's where they are. They always need help. And that's okay. If that's where you are, that's okay. You recognize yourself. But the way you start doing it, you start standing on the word of God, asking questions. Ask questions. Hey, how do you do that? Not only just asking, help me, how can I, if this happens again, how can I respond better? Do you see this? And then somebody can actually show you scriptures. The second thing, and I'm going to move on quick. The second thing is, kids are curious. Children, they're curious. And one of the things you see in the area of curiosity is that they want to, the, the, the curiosity is that they want to know. Oh, just, just tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. When is this going to happen? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? How many of you or your kids love to say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, they're just curious. And you, they ask you a question and you give them the answer and they go, why? And then you give them another answer and they go, why? And you give them another answer and you know, why? Children are curious. And sometimes it's just, they just, fulfilling the, 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 the curiosity, not necessarily. They learn in it, but they're just in that stage where they're curious about everything. They're not necessarily asking you a, a question that's based on the fact that they've, the answer you've given them, they've pondered it. Because while you're answering that question, they're already ready to say, why? <laughs> Because that's where they are. They're curious, right? But the curiosity is good because that's how to learn. But sometimes the curiosity is also expressed in the fact that they want to do what they see adults do. They're curious about it. Or they test their limits. They say, well, don't do this. Guess what they want to do? That which you said don't do. Because they're curious. Well, what, what's in it? Well, what, how, well, how come I can't? I remember when I was a child, my parents bought a, a, a book for my sister. And the title was um, For Girls Only. I was a child. I read the book. <laughs> uh, curious. No. I read part of the book. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> you know, curious. Just want to know. Just want to know. It's good because you need a certain level of curiosity if you're going to grow in God. you got to want to know. Remember uh, Moses. Moses was in the wilderness, and he saw a fire burning. He saw a fire burning in a bush, and the bush was not consumed. And the Bible says, he turned aside to see. Some people, in today's day and age, that's weird. And they move on. <laughs> you know, there's no curiosity. It was in his curiosity, it's in his looking that the Lord spoke out to him. I think there's a certain level of curiosity that's good. But there's a, 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 maybe... For lack of a better way of saying it, I believe this is also curiosity where people just want to do what, oh, if that person is doing, I think I can do it too. I don't know if you know that your kids, when they're four, 
wants to do dishes with you. They want to cook. They want to clean. They're curious. They're curious. When they're 15, you ask them to cook. <laughs> you ask them to clean. And now, like, um, do I really? Can we just order in? Right? Why? Because they're not doing it out of curiosity anymore. They know how to cook. They know how to clean. It's not as exciting. And we've got to be careful in, in our spiritual development that the reason why we're excited about God is not because everything is new. When we're growing and everything is new, as a child, that curiosity fuels your passion to learn. But as you get older, as you get more mature, the maturity is in still being excited even after you already known it. You know, some pastors are pressured every Sunday. They're petrified because they have to come in. They have a bunch of babies and kids in their church. So they have to come in and bring something so new every week so that the people can keep coming. That's because people want something new. Oh, well, well, you know, yeah, I know that Jesus heals. I, I know that Jesus saves. I, I know, you know, give me some elaborate illustration on a very simple topic, and you might get me come back again. <laughs> Are you with me? Curiosity. They just, oh, give me something new. We don't want our growth to only be fueled by curiosity. We want to want to know God, want to deepen our experience with God from just knowing that this is the truth and staying with it. Don't have to tell me anything new. Just tell me the same truth and I'm eating it. Hello? You don't need to go to a new restaurant every day. Once you find a good restaurant, you stick with it and it's good. Also, oh, oh, it's the same. Are we having rice again? Of course we're having rice again. It's good. It's good. And that's, that's the difference when your curiosity is what's fueling your spiritual growth. You're only interest in, uh, interested in the word because something tickles your ear today, because that person says something so profound that you've never thought of. No. In that case, at, at this certain level of maturity, we all should just stay home. Right? But that's not true. You know, the word is food to our, our, our spirit. So we're talking about curiosity. The next item on there is that kids are talkative. They love to talk about everything. They love to express everything that is in their mind. Oh, yeah, and I was thinking this and this and that. And they want to tell a story. And sometimes, you know, we, we've come out of a busy thing, you know, maybe with a lot of people. And personally, I just want that 30 seconds that we got back in the car for me to figure out where we're going and everything. And the kids get in the car and say, oh, daddy, this. Oh, my goodness. They should invite a parent's uh, earmuffs. <laughs> He's just put on for 30 seconds, just 30 seconds to clear my mind. But no, they're so excited and they want to talk. And it's good. Remember, I'm not saying this isn't good. But it's indicative of where they are in their development. Their children, they want to talk. They want to talk all the time. And some, even though I know that as parents, and I know you've done that, I'm like, can I just get a moment, please? You know? <laughs> Kids want to talk all the time. And I saw a meme on social media. I thought this is funny, and I tried it. It says, um, Daddy napping tips. It said, if you want to get a nap, tell the kids that you're going to go to sleep and when you wake up, we're going to clean the house. Wake me up in 30 minutes. <laughs> and then <laughs> and the meme says, they will do everything but wake you up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> I told the kids. We're going to clean the house. They're like, why? <laughs> the house is clean. I said, don't worry. We're going to clean the house. We're cleaning again. <laughs> but wake me up. <laughs> and they stayed away. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> oh, I guess I'm a kid too. <laughs> oh. 
Anyway, where was I? The talkative. <laughs> the, the talkative, they just want to talk about everything. One of the things that's really important is that it's good that you're learning things spiritually, but sometimes no need to talk about it yet. Hello? No need to, not everything you learn do you run out and go tell other people. Not everything you learn is gospel news to be shared. Are you with me? Some things are things for you to digest and apply in your life. This is one of the areas, and that talkativeness is why you're going out and sharing, not because of whether or not the person needs it, can take it, or is the right time. Just want to share. Remember when we were doing campus ministry years ago, there was a guy who, who had come, came later, and encountered all this thing that we're teaching, and his life got transformed. And they were so excited one day and said, I'm going to go share this. I said, no, you, you shouldn't share it yet. He said, oh, well, well, why? I said, because you don't know it enough. You're not established in it already. You're just practicing this thing. This is new to you. Meditate on it. Go back to the word. Pour it over. Didn't listen to me. Went out and started sharing and then came back because he was misspeaking and people didn't understand him. He got into debates and with people and now he's sad because he didn't understand why all this thing was happening to him. You know why I was able to give him that answer? Because I was him. <laughs> everything I learned I went out and shared with people I told people I said you're not a sinner you're, you're, you're a saint right which is true I told people you know you, we can say it here right because you come here to learn right and Leo just mentioned that to us reminded us that so when I went and told people I just ran out and told people and they hated me for it do you remember what the scripture says? It says, do not cast your pearls before swines. It says, lest they trample on it. Your precious stone, you just throw it in front of swines. And they trample on it. And do you know what the next line says? Do you know what the next line says? It says, and they turn and tear you to pieces. So some kids are just talkative. They go around and say, oh, God, it's God's will to heal everybody. Yeah, it is. But you don't need to go and prematurely say things that you haven't even ingested yet. Oh, Moses, do you not want us to tell people that it's God's will to heal everybody? I want you to. But I want you to be discerning and not to. See, there's a passage in Scripture that I believe uh, the NIV mistranslated. Uh, Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. It says that the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. The NIV and similar translation says, by the sharing of everything that is in you. So some people think that the way to grow is by sharing. I don't believe that. The way to grow is by meditating on the word of God and acting on it. If you're acting on the word of God, your impetus for sharing is the word of God. You'll be in a better place to share it than to just be moved from emotional reaction. That Oh, I learned something new. I got to tell people. I got to tell people. No, I, I learn because then I figure out, wait a minute, what I'm sharing is good. How come they're rejecting it? Because I was just a child who is talkative. You with me? Just a child who is talkative. Some of those things is better for me to just ponder them in myself. And I'll tell you, there's still an area when it comes to sharing that I'm growing in. Because I want everybody to know what I know. But that's a childish mentality. Do you think what you know is that shallow? that you can go around and share with everybody. And what you know, you didn't learn in 30 minutes. You learned over time. 
Why are you going around with and sharing it with people who don't have the, sub, the, the foundation that you already had built? So sharing is better when you understand your audience and you know exactly what part of the good news that you have is relevant in that situation. Is that too deep? Okay, so talkativeness. Kids just talk all the time. And then let me talk another one about the talkative part of it is that some people, they still talk like they're in the world. They, they, they speak evil and they speak foolishly. Right? So they speak evil, things that are unwholesome, things that are just not right, jokes, inconvenient jesting. They do it. I mean, if you have kid, boy, whoever raised a boy, you know, you know, at a certain age, the certain words that they want to, that's not good in polite company, but it's funny for boys. It has to do with bathroom. You know, you know, they just want, they, they want to find a way to use the word in a sentence because they're children. Chastin. Spiritually, there are some people who just find, some people are still looking at me. Okay, I'm talking about number two. They want to make it, m bring it into a conversation. Everybody know what I'm talking about? And it's not a swear word. It's just not. Okay, I'm talking about poop. Because <laughs> some people are looking at me like, are you, you know, boys just want to work that into a conversation. Isaiah, remember? <laughs> you know, they just want to work it into the conversations that, well, no, don't say that, right? Some adults, spiritually speaking, they try to work things that are inconvenient into conversation. Inconvenient jokes. They're immature, so they speak foolishly. Okay, let me move on. And the last one I want to talk about, and we're going to close today, is they're learning obedience. They're learning obedience, and this is important because this is going to determine what kind of kid, uh, what kind of adult that kid grows up to be. They're learning obedience. The Bible tells us that Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. One of the things that kids actually love is structure. When you give them structure, and you, it, it ups them to regulate themselves. They have a boundless energy. They want to do this. They want to do that. So structure kind of helps them to know, oh, this is what I'm doing next. This is what I'm doing next. Awesome. Spiritually speaking, there are some believers that lack structure. They've not submitted themselves into an environment where they can learn obedience. And you see, learning obedience is so key to your spiritual growth. And we are new creation, you know, you, you, there is no intermediary between you and God. None. You have direct access to the Father. But God has placed you not on a deserted, deserted island. God has placed you in a body. And you will flourish and be nourished by that which each of these joint supplies. But it takes you learning obedience, obeying the word of God, obeying those who have rule over you in the body of Christ, obeying uh, the, 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 the elders in the Lord. Obe and I'm using the word obeying. I'm not saying, you know, respect what they say. I'm saying obey them. Oh, Moses, shouldn't, aren't we spirit-led believers? Yeah, we are. That's why we obey. Do you know the most spirit-led person ever? Jesus. Let's look at Luke chapter 2. Something happened in Luke chapter 2 where Jesus went to the temple in Jerusalem. He was a child. He had to grow. He went to the temple in Jerusalem with his family, and um, he got caught up in the deep conversation, theological conversation with the teachers in the temple. And the family thought he was traveling. It's a different time. The family thought he was traveling with his other, he was with his cousins and relatives. And um, when they realized that he's not with the other kids, 
and they were going back to look for him. Anyway, by the time they found him, it's like two days. They found Jesus, and they said, oh, we have been worried. We've been looking for you all over the place. I'm reading from verse 48 now. And when they saw him, Luke chapter 2 from verse 48 to 52. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why have you dealt with us like this? Behold, your father and I have sought you sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you are looking for me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Talking about God. And they understood not the same which he spoke unto them. And verse 51, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth. Look at the next line. And was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. When I read that line recently, I just, I thought, this is the creator of the universe. And he subjected himself to people who didn't even understand what he was saying. He had revelation that they didn't have. He subjected himself. Sometimes believers think that you subject yourself or obey or set yourself in the body only to people whose gifting and more fantastic than yours. No. You subject yourself or you learn obedience in the body of Christ for your own development. And that person may not even have any outwardly noticeable gifting particularly, but is a mature believer Somebody who have proved things and have st stood the test of time and I have, and is held in good reputation as a person of faith, a man full of the Holy Spirit, a woman full of the Holy Spirit, you can learn so much from them. You know, and for those of you who are preachers, this is very uh, applicable. Preachers, you don't just submit yourself to other preachers or just to people who have similar gifting. There's so much, but there are other people that God will bring in your life that are solid and right for you to be in relationship and obedience to. You don't submit yourself to a pastor because the pastor uh, meets some external criteria other than the one that the Bible says. You don't submit yourself to the a church because the church is flashy or because the church has uh, 30,000 people. No. You submit yourself to a church because that's the scripture. You're not looking for external validation. You're looking to the word of God to show that. That's what kids needs to do. You got to establish who is deciding what happens. It's very important for our spiritual development. That's one of the reasons why I've seen some people um, they just get themselves exercised in things that are too great for them. That they don't know anything about. You learn obedience. You learn obedience. People were teaching you the word of God. You learn obedience by signing up for a program and say, hey, I'm going to stick to it. It's going to take uh, eight weeks or ten weeks. How many weeks are we saying? Eight to ten weeks. I haven't made it. Ten weeks. Let's just go with ten weeks. It's going to take ten weeks, and I'm sticking to it. I'm learning obedience. Oh, but I, I really didn't know. I know what they're going to be talking about. I'm learning obedience. I'm showing up. I'm just showing up. So, uh, years ago, I was pastoring a group of young adults, and uh, one of the girls there said to me that, oh, when she first became a Christian, that what, they were to what helped her to grow is somebody just, the, the pastor said, she's like, oh, what do I, how can I grow? How can I grow? And the pastor says, just keep showing up. And so she took that to heart. And every time, every Sunday, she's there. Just showing up, just showing up, just showing up. Learning obedience. On the other hand, I heard some people that said, well, I don't know all this pastor thing. Why don't they just tell us everything on one day 
so we don't need to keep coming back. <laughs> That's somebody who doesn't know anything and who is not learning obedience. Not two different perspectives. But sometimes you just show up. You know, sometimes I don't ask some questions around certain things. I've been in situations where uh, 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 spiritual leaders have said to me, do this. And it didn't make sense to me. It's not against the word of God. It's the wisdom that they had. And I don't have the word of God contrary to what they said. The Bible says, obey them in the Lord, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. So the qualifier for this objection is it has to be in the Lord. Don't suspend your, what God's word says in your desire to obey or please somebody, right? So they said to me, oh, do this. There is no, nothing in the word of God that says don't do this. It's a matter of a preference at the time. But I, I didn't know what to do exactly at the time. But their judgment makes more sense to me. Hello? Well, actually, it didn't really make sense to me because I'm thinking, oh, I'll miss out on this if I do what you said. But I said, well, I'm going to trust their judgment and do what they said. You see, it doesn't take anything from me to obey. It didn't. I'm still here. But it helped me navigate at that crucial time in my life. And I just was able to, and then later I saw the wisdom of what they said. But it doesn't really matter whether I saw the wisdom of it or not. The, what mattered is this is trusted leadership that's given me direct, uh, counsel that's not against God's word, not against the witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart. So, it's a win-win situation. So I obeyed. Hello? This is an important part of growing up. One of the things that we've been saying to you is you need to have a concerted time where you're getting into the word and praying. Obey. <laughs> Say, oh, Moses, you know, I'm a grace person. You know, the way it works for me is this. It will do you well to just make a time and get into the word of God. Well, but I don't want to be legalistic about it. It would do you well to just obey. Especially if the pattern is that you've not been getting into the word. If the pattern is you've been inconsistent in getting into the word, then we're telling you something and you can trust our leadership and just obey and say, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. When you mature enough, maybe, you, maybe the Lord will lead you into something else but I don't think it would lead you out of getting into the word and pray. Amen? Are you, did you get something today? Amen. Amen. We're going to wrap up here. Glory to God. Let us rise together. We believe in God for a church that's mature. A church that's not here because of external things. Oh, I go there because people... No, no. We go, we, we're connected. This is a God thing. We're connected. And God is raising people up here. We believe in God. That God is going to raise up preachers in this church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We believe God is going to raise people up that will be financiers of the gospel. God's going to raise people up that are going to be all kinds of gift governments and helps, ministries of help, showing of mercy and so on. But we're going to all mature together, not by what one joint supplies over here. We're going to mature together by that which every joint supplies. And that's why being in a family setting is so important. If you're not connected and you want to be connected. There are, there are people that would love to sit down with you and walk with you in your spiritual walk. There are people in this congregation that would love to do that. There are people that we meet with. There are people, if you want, if that's your desire, say, I just want to get more connected. Well, one way to do it is sign up to, to, to volunteer to do something. Because in doing things together, you connect more. A lot of our friends here, 
we became closer as we work together for the kingdom of God and we spend our time, right? Together. Do that. It will help you. It gets out of hand. Help us in those areas as well, where we're talkative, where we're where we lack discipline, where we're learning obedience. Help us, oh God. In fact, I pray for children here that has uh, stumbled a few times and they're bruised. The Father, they would experience, <coughs> they would experience the healing power that comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can right this moment. Because then you can start and join us on this development spiritually. So you can just simply say a prayer and say, Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I believe he died for my sins. He was buried and he rose again from the dead. I believe he's the son of God. I turn away from my sins towards Jesus. I confess Jesus as my Lord and my master. I believe in him right now. I believe I'm born again. The blood of Jesus washes me. I am clean and in the family of God. In Jesus' name. With all eyes closed, let's just continue to pray right now. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over diseases in this place right now. In Jesus' name. I bind you sickness. I bind you disease. I command you to leave now in Jesus' name. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Does anybody have a, a word of knowledge, a revelation right now? Anybody? Word of knowledge, revelation? Glory to God. Anyone? You have something? Yeah. Coming up. Glory to God. We take authority over infirmities in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. And that confirms what we're talking about this morning, Zoltan. Right, Zoltan? That confirms what we're talking about this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's take authority over sicknesses. Can we do that? Just say with me. By the wounds of Jesus, I am healed. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sins. Because I've been cleansed from sin, I refuse the consequence of sin. I refuse sickness. I refuse diseases. I speak to my body. Body, you are whole. You are healed. You are made strong. What? looks like it's not working. It's working. I command it to work perfectly. Now, in the name of Jesus, I command growth to disappear. Go. In the name of Jesus, I command tumors to go. In the name of Jesus, Jesus says, if you shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart, but shall believe those things which you say, you shall have what you say. So I say, 
sicknesses, infirmities, symptoms of them, go, be removed from me. In the name of Jesus. Veins, be open. Arteries, be open. Begin to function properly, normally, optimally. In the name of Jesus, I speak to my heart and my lungs. You are whole. You are functioning. I declare it. I decree it. In the name of Jesus, I speak to my digestive tract. You are functioning properly, optimally. You have everything you need for strong health. I decree it. I declare it. In the name of Jesus, I speak to my back and my limbs. You are made strong. My bones are healed. My spines are made strong. I'm a believer. I believe the word of God. In the name of Jesus, my brain is protected. Curses are reversed. Damages are reversed. I am healed from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I rejoice in my healing. I rejoice in my healing. I rejoice in my healing. Thank you, Father. Glory to Jesus.